Okay. Uh, yeah, merci beaucoup, Angela. That was a very, very kind of you. And uh, well done on the conference, which is going great. I've um, really been enjoying all the talks, and we've had some really great deep dives uh, already today into cutting-edge technologies, what's happening today on the web, what we are going can expect in the future. Very exciting stuff. But I want to take a bit of a step back. Um, I'm going to be a bit more like a historian here, I think. I'm going to look at where, where the web comes from. Uh, and on the face of it, that's kind of a silly question to ask because there's a very obvious answer to where the web comes from. Uh, it comes from this guy. This is uh, Tim Berners-Lee. We've already heard about him earlier today. And yes, he, he literally invented the web. Uh, it was the late 80s. He was working at CERN. And in March of uh, 1989, he put forward this proposal, very dull looking proposal with incomprehensible diagrams it was titled Information Management a Proposal. Not very snappy. But you know, his supervisor, Mike Sendall, he must have seen some, uh, some potential here because he scrawled across the top, vague but exciting. So Tim Berners-Lee did get the go-ahead to work on this uh, information management proposal he wanted to do. And he built the World Wide Web. Um, he built the first web server, the first uh, web browser, the first website. And he did it all on this machine. This is uh, NextCube. Uh, Next was the company that Steve Jobs founded after he was kicked out of Apple there for a while. And this is the actual machine here. You can see this was this is in the Science Museum in London. Uh, and I have a great fondness for this machine because I was really fortunate back in 2019 to be involved in a project to commemorate the 30th anniversary of that proposal and of that first web server, web browser, web page. Uh, and I got to go along to CERN, which was amazing. And Angela was there too. And John, you can see there too. And it really was um, a, a wonderful experience. Uh, what we were doing there was trying to recreate what it would have been like to use this first web browser, which was confusingly enough called World Wide Web. And all these super smart people there, like Angela, Remy, all these people are building effectively an emulation of using this first web browser in a modern browser. And to cut to the chase, it worked. And you can now go to worldwideweb.cern.ch, type in a URL, and you can see how uh, a modern website would look in this, in this first web browser. So you can have a play with that. Now, while all those really smart people were doing the hard work and, and building uh, the actual browser part. I was working on the website about the browser, particularly this bit, which is a timeline of the web. Now, it's 30 years of the web, so it's fairly obvious that I should have what's happened in the last 30 years, what you know, since the web was created, what's happened since then. But I thought it would also be interesting to look backwards from the point of the web's creation. So in other words, to look back 30 years before the web, because I wanted to know the influences. I wanted to know what was influencing Tim Berners-Lee to come up with uh, the World Wide Web, because it comes from different areas, right? Networks, hypertext, computing in general. Now, if you were to ask Tim Berners-Lee himself uh, who the biggest influences on him have been, he'd give you a, a straight answer. Um, he'd say the biggest influences have been Conway Berners-Lee and Mary Lee Woods, his father and his mother. And that's all very nice, and and we're used to this, right? You people, you ask people who their influences are, and they'll tell you, you know, my parents, they they were very kind to me, they gave me this loving, nurturing environment, and that's true in this case. But they were also an influence in a very practical way, which is that both Conway Berners Lee and Mary Lee Woods were programmers. In fact, that's where they met. They were programmers on this machine, the Ferranti Mark One, uh, one of the earliest uh, computers in in the UK. This would have been in the 1950s. UK. Now, I'm going back quite a ways here to the 1950s, and here we've got an early computer, but I could go back further. Uh, how far back should I go? What what counts as the, f the first computer? Uh, is this the first computer? This is the uh, Antikythera mechanism uh, discovered in the 20th century, but it was it's in a shipwreck, but it, it goes back thousands of years, and it is a calculating device. Uh, you can see it in the museum in Athens. This could calculate the position of the stars, which is really impressive. So maybe it's an early computer. 
but it's not programmable. Maybe that's the difference between what we what we decide is the first computer. Maybe we look to this person. This is Charles Babbage. Uh, well, specifically, this is half of Charles Babbage's brain, which is in the Science Museum in London, along with that next machine that Tim Berners-Lee used. Uh, the other half of Charles Babbage's brain is in uh, the Computing History Museum in California. Anyway, Charles Babbage, he lived in the 19th century, and he was kind of a Victorian entrepreneur who got seed funding from the government. Uh, he had this uh, scheme to build a programmable device. It was the uh, analytical engine. First of all, there was the difference engine, later the analytical engine. And by any definition, you could say this is a computer. It is capable of computation. It is programmable but it never did actually get finished. Still, the breakthrough came with this idea of programming, and that came not so much from Charles Babbage, but from his collaborator, the Enchantress of Numbers, Ada Lovelace. She was translating some notes from an Italian math mathematician uh, about difference engines, and she made this connection that, wait, we've got a device here that can operate on numbers, right? We're doing numerical computation. But suppose those numbers could stand for other things, concepts, words, ideas, then you could do computation on concepts and words and ideas. And that's pretty much what we do today. Like computers deal with numbers, they deal with ones and zeros, but those ones and zeros stand in for things like words or pixels or colors. So, you know, when you're using a word processor, you're not actually processing words, you're dealing with ones and zeros. When you're using a graphic design tool, you're not actually moving pixels around, you're dealing with ones and zeros. But this idea that ones and zeros or numbers are enough to express anything, that was the real breakthrough that uh, Ada Lovelace made. And it's really the, the idea of programming, I think. But like I say, the difference engine, the analytical engine, they never got made. So these ideas never really got to be an influence on later pioneers. Uh, for example, uh, this genius, Alan Turing, he had no awareness of Charles Babbage or Ada Lovelace when he was coming up with his concept of the universal Turing machine. Uh, this th initially theoretical concept of you know an infinite length of tape that could make decisions, it was a state machine. Effectively, it's computers. It's what we now use today. They are Turing machines. Um, and he wasn't just involved in the theoretical side of things. He was also involved in making these things a reality uh, with very pressing need because he was working at Bletchley Park during World War II, trying to crack the uh, codes from the Enigma machines. Uh, and he came up with the bombs to do that. And then following that, there was the creation of a computer at Bletchley Park. This is Colossus at Bletchley Park. And I would say that this is the first uh, programmable computer, working programmable computer, using vacuum tubes, using valves. Interestingly, though, this is the work at Bletchley Park was so top secret that for years after the war, uh, nobody knew about how advanced they were and what they were doing. So you'll still even see today in the history books that the first programmable computer was ENIAC in America. But I think the honor goes to Colossus. Now, the work done at Bletchley Park, it sometimes does get overstated. And I won't, I won't go as far as to say that, you know, it succeeded in winning the war. But I think it is fair to say that the work done at Bletchley Park, the code breaking, it did help shorten the war that if it weren't for the work done at Bletchley Park, maybe the war wouldn't have ended in 1945. But in our timeline, the war did end in 1945. And also in 1945, uh, this person wrote a very interesting article. This is Van Ivar Bush. He's kind of like a pop scientist of the day. He's like the Neil deGrasse Tyson or the Brian Cox of the 1940s. And uh, he published something in the uh, Atlantic Monthly in 1945, it, you know, it's like a scientist's thoughts on the future. He wrote an article called As We May Think. And in this article, he describes a device. It's a desk. It's analog. It's got microfilm, but reams and reams of microfilm. And the operator of this desk can, you know, connect ideas, connect concepts, link things from one to the other. Effectively, he's describing hypertext, but before the term hypertext 
uh, even exists. Now, he calls this theoretical device the Memex, and this was definitely an influence on Tim Berners-Lee. It was an influence on somebody else, too. So it's 1945. This young man has signed up for the Navy in the United States. He's getting ready to ship out to the Pacific. He's going to be fighting the Japanese there. His name is Douglas Engelbart. And literally, as the ship is leaving the harbor, the word comes through that the war is over. Now, he still gets shipped out to the Pacific, but instead of uh, fighting, he's now basically sitting in a hut and reading magazines. And one of the magazines he reads is the Atlantic Monthly. And he reads this article, as we may think, written by Vannevar Bush. It makes a big impression on him. And years later, he's, he's basically trying to decide what to do with his life. How can he make the world a better place? And he realizes he can make the world a better place by trying to make the memex a reality, but not using analog technology like microfilm, but using computers, which are now getting better and better. So Douglas Engelbart gets to work, and he creates something called the online system, or NLS, which he demos on December 9th, 1968. And it is groundbreaking. He's got co real-time collaboration between computers in different places. He's in San Francisco. There's a video link up to Menlo Park. They're doing collaborative editing on documents. There's hyperlinks between documents. Oh, and also for this demo, he invents the mouse. Right. It would be 1984 before we'd see commercial use of this technology, but he invented it for this demo, which be, came to be known as the mother of all demos and was certainly an influence on Tim Berners-Lee. So this is 1968. This means we have now reached that point in the timeline where we've entered the 30 years of the time cone previous to the World Wide Web, which is good because this is exactly the point where I want to branch off and I want to follow a different stream. Because at the mother of all demos, while Douglas Engelbart is in San Francisco, and they've got this video link up with Menlo Park, the question that none of you are asking, for good reason, is who's operating the video camera in Menlo Park? But that's the question I'm going to answer. I'm going to tell you who's operating the video camera in Menlo Park at the mother of all demos. It is this person. This is Stuart Brand. Now, Stuart Brand has spent the 60s doing what you would generally do in the 60s. He's um, turning on, tuning in, dropping out. He's investigating LSD. He's on the Merry Pranksters bus, bus with Ken Kesey. Uh, he's also involved in, in activism. Uh, he has this campaign uh, for a while, because one time he has this, this acid trip where he's on a rooftop, and he, he sees the world bending away from him, and he has this revelation that we're all on one planet, man. And he starts a campaign of these badges that say, why haven't we seen a photograph of the whole earth yet? I like, the, you know, the inclusion of the word yet implies that there's some kind of conspiracy here, why we haven't seen it. Uh, th this is just one of the, the things he's involved with. And, but th there's, there's a logic to this, this idea that if we could see the whole earth, which remember nobody has seen at this point, that this could shift people's perspectives, that we would become better caretakers of our planet. We would have this overview effect. And later, he, when we did get pictures of the whole Earth, he used those pictures on the cover of his publication, The Whole Earth Catalog, which was effectively like Wikipedia before the web. It was everything you needed to know about how to run a commune, right? Technology, agriculture, you name it. So he's got his uh, irons in the fire for a lot of uh, different things. He's also an author. Uh, he writes articles like this classic article in Rolling Stone magazine in 1972, because after the mother of all demos, he realizes computers are really something. And computers, he literally says at one point, computers are the new LSD. This is an article about space wars, about one of the first games that used a screen, uh, the, the space war game. Later on, he would write about something completely different. He wrote a book about architecture called How Buildings Learn. Uh, there's also a television series, and you can watch the whole thing on YouTube. Now, this is a, a classic book, and uh, the definition of a classic book, uh, for me anyway, is a book that everyone's heard of and, and nobody's read. And that's, that's certainly the case with uh, How Buildings Learn. Uh, in this book, he talks about the work of a British architect called Frank Duffy. And Frank Duffy introduces the idea of 
shearing layers in architecture. What Frank Duffy is saying is that a building properly conceived is several layers of longevity. And he's got this diagram here to show these, these layers of longevity, like the site that a building is built on. You're talking about a geological time scale, right? Thousands of years. Uh, then the structure you hope will stand for hundreds of years. Then you start to get into the infrastructure, the plumbing, the wiring. You might have to change that out every few decades. You get down to the doors, the windows, until you're inside the rooms and you've got furniture, the stuff that you could move around on a daily basis, right? So the time scales are getting shorter and shorter as you sort of move inwards towards the building. I think what's also interesting here from my viewpoint is that each layer depends on the layer below. You can't have stuff in a room until you have a room with walls. You can't have the walls until you have the structure of the building. You can't have a structure of a building until you've got a site to put the buildings on. So after writing this book on architecture later, he, he also goes on to found a foundation called the Long Now Foundation, of which I am a proud member. This is my uh, membership card. It's made of metal because it's got to last for thousands and thousands of years. They're very serious about the whole long-term thinking thing. In fact, if you go on the website for the Long Now Foundation, longnow.org, you'll notice that all the years uh, on the website are, are written with five digits. So instead of uh, 2021, it'll be 0 2021. Um, you know, so you, we're not going to fall victim to the Y10K problem. One of the most famous projects of the Long Now Foundation is the clock of the Long Now, which will tell time for 10,000 years. This is a prototype of the clock of the Long Now, which is in the Science Museum of London, along with half of Charles Babbage's brain and the original next box that Tim Berners-Lee created the World Wide Web on. The full-size clock of the Long Now uh, will actually be inside a mountain in West Texas, a geologically stable area. Uh, it's being built right now. This isn't a conceptual thing. This is a, a real thing, a clock that will tell time for 10,000 years. And if you think about the design challenges involved in building anything for 10,000 years, it gets really interesting. It's kind of like the, the Voyager Golden Record or the you know nuclear waste disposal on Yucca Mountain. How do you communicate across such a long time scale? You can't use language. You can't use iconography. So the design challenges are fascinating. And Stuart Brand put together essays you know, based on some of these design challenges in this book, the the clock of the long now, time and responsibility, the ideas behind the world's slowest computer. And there's an essay in here that takes the concept of pace layers that he had discovered from that British architect, Frank Duffy, and he extrapolates it into something called, I'm oh, sorry, shearing layers, it extrapolates into something called pace layers. So instead of just thinking in terms of architecture, this concept of these several layers of longevity can be applied to pretty much anything. The, any system, a biological system, an artificial system, has these pace layers built in. And it's a fascinating concept. It's one of these ideas that you just start seeing everywhere. Uh, Stuart Brand took the idea and he mapped it out to our species. Like for human beings, for, for our species, there are pace layers. At the slowest moving layer at the bottom, you've got uh, you know our physiological nature. This is our, our DNA, which is unchanged for tens of thousands of years. There's no physiological difference between a caveman and an astronaut. But then you've got the stuff we build up over, over centuries, which is our, our culture, uh, languages, nations, things like this. Then, slightly faster moving, uh, governance, not governments now, but systems of government. Like, is this a feudal society, a monarchy, a representative democracy? These things do change, but not that often. Then you get into infrastructure, which does need to change more often. You get into commerce, much faster moving now, right? We're talking down to, to months and years. And then finally at the top, he puts this layer of fashion. And fashion is incredibly fast, fast moving, and it's supposed to be fast moving. It's also supposed to produce things that are discarded quickly. The idea with the fashion layer is it's fast moving, so you can try things out, throw things at the wall. What about this? No, that's not working. How about this? How about that? So you think things like pop songs, right? They're you know, here today, gone tomorrow. But the idea is that you know some stuff might stick. So a really good pop song might move down from the layer of fashion over time and become part of culture. So these, these layers, these pace layers moving at different speeds, here's how Stuart Brand describes it. He says, fast learns, but slow remembers. Fast proposes and slow disposes. 
and fast is discontinuous, slow is continuous. And fast and small instructs slow and big by a crude innovation and occasional revolution. But slow and big controls small and fast by constraint and constancy. And he says, fast gets all our attention, but slow has all the power. Now, like I said, this concept of, of pace layers, once I was introduced to it, I started to see it everywhere. Um, like everything just looks like pace layers to me. It's like, you know, if you want to make someone's life a misery, you teach them about typography because then they can't unsee all the terrible kerning in the world. It's kind of like that with pace layers for me. I just can't unsee it. Like, does anyone remember when this book came out? It's gone back a while now, but the, the Elements of User Experience by Jesse James Garrett is a big influence in the world of UX. And there's this diagram in it, which has these elements of user experience. And I took one look, I'm like, that is pace layers. This is, you know, this can be mapped onto the pace layer diagram. So I started to think, what else, what else can I map onto this idea of pace layers? And I wondered if I could map the World Wide Web onto this, this structure, this idea of different layers of longevity. So I'm going to have a go at it. Here we go. At the slowest moving layer, you've got the internet itself and the protocols of the internet, TCP IP, Transmission Control Protocol and the Internet Protocol, created by Bob Kahn and Vince Cerf in 1983 and pretty much unchanged since. And that feels right. We wouldn't want this to change out from under us. Very simple protocols, deliberately so, deliberately dumb. They deliberately don't care about the contents of the packets being switched around. But then other people can create protocols on top of TCP IP. And that's exactly what Tim Berners-Lee did when he created HTTP, the hypertext transfer protocol. This was one of the things he created back then, 1989. It has changed. We now have HTTP 2. We're heading towards HTTP 3. But that change is gradual. And that feels good. This, again, this doesn't feel like something we'd want to switch out too quickly. It could be quite disruptive. So what do we transmit uh, at HTTP, using HTTP? Well, URLs, that's the, the other sort of big uh, invention of Tim Berners-Lee. I would say maybe the most important one. And I would love it if URLs were way down at the bottom layer and they never changed and never went away. Uh, but unfortunately, URLs do change. And that, I think it's a bit of a shame. I think we can work hard to make sure that URLs don't change, but you do have to put the work into it. Certainly the fundamental structure of URLs has not changed in quite a while. What do we put at those URLs? The most basic thing you could put would be a plain text file. But as this is the web, let's talk about structured text. And that would be HTML. Again, created by Tim Berners-Lee in 1989. Though really, he just kind of stole it wholesale from SGML, which was already being used at CERN. Used tags that people were already using. Now, HTML has expanded. The original HTML that Tim Berners-Lee had was about 20 elements. Now we've got over 100 elements. But it's been gradual. It was kind of a bit of a Wild West phase at the beginning where everyone was just making up HTML elements. And things settled down. The last big sort of push for new HTML elements was with HTML5. That's 10 years ago now. So I feel like HTML changes, but at a rate that uh, I'm comfortable with. Like it's not, it's not like I wake up every morning going, OK, what's new in HTML today? Um, we also got CSS which definitely moves faster. Uh, it's a bit, you know, the, the rate of change is maybe a bit more exciting than with HTML because uh, we we do have stuff to keep up with, but it, it feels it feels okay to me anyway. It feels like, oh yeah, CSS, I can keep up with the latest uh, layout technologies, you know, grid and flexbox, the latest things we can do with color and fonts on the web. And then the very tippy top, we've got the JavaScript ecosystem. And I say the JavaScript ecosystem rather than just JavaScript, the language, because actually the JavaScript language evolves and changes at a fairly steady pace, maybe comparable to CSS or HTML. But everything we do with JavaScript, so libraries, frameworks, build tools, uh, all that stuff, man, does that change quickly, right? I mean, I do wake up every morning and wonder what's new in the world of JavaScript today. You know, and it, it feels overwhelming to me, right? <laughs> like, oh, you're still using that framework? <sighs> That's so passe. We've switched over to this new thing. Oh, you're still using that way of writing React? We switched to this new way of doing it. You know, that, that build tool pool that so last week, we've all switched over to this new thing. It, it feels personally really overwhelming to me. Um, 
you know, if it feels overwhelming to you, drop drop a little message in the chat. Say yes if you feel overwhelmed, because I think it would be interesting to see if uh, if if uh, I'm alone here, if other people feel this way. But I will say this: having mapped out these layers onto this pace layer model. And I see that the JavaScript ecosystem, I think, lives at the fashion layer. I think, oh, OK. It's kind of meant to be super fast moving. It's meant to be trying stuff out and, and discarding half the stuff and moving on to the next thing. Right? That's kind of the idea. And the good ideas will stick and move down. And that's definitely happened over the history of JavaScript. Like, OK, I'll show my age and talk about the first uses of JavaScript that I can remember would have been things like doing image rollovers. You, the, the mouse rolls over an image, you swap it out for another image. Um, well, these days, I wouldn't even use JavaScript for that because I've got colon hover in CSS. So that that you know moved down a layer into CSS. But one of the other early use cases of JavaScript was with form validation. Uh, does that email form field look like it's been filled in with a real email address? Or uh, has that required field been filled in? Again, today, I wouldn't even use JavaScript to do that. I would use HTML. I would write input type equals email required. So again, these really common use cases move down the, the layers from this fast moving uh, imperative layer with JavaScript into the slower moving but more stable declarative layers like CSS and HTML. You can see with stuff like responsive images too, right? We, we hacked around, we got it working in JavaScript, and then got into spec, and it moves down into HTML. Fast learns, slow remembers. And here's the other thing about looking at this layered approach to the web is I realized this maps to how I build on the web. I mean, I, I usually don't consider TCP IP or HTTP. I take that for granted. But you know, URL first web design is, is a really underrated approach, in my opinion. I do like to think about the structure first before thinking about the presentation, then layer on the presentation, and then layer on the behavior with JavaScript. So this layered approach works for building websites as, as well as the web itself. But here's the thing. It's a testament to the power and flexibility of the web that if you don't want to build this way, you don't have to. In fact, if you wanted to build this way, you can. JavaScript is very powerful. If you wanted to um, do all the HTTP stuff like routing and, and navigations in JavaScript, yeah, you can do that, right? Uh, if you want to inject the DOM instead of using HTML, you can do it with JavaScript. If you want CSS in JS, yes, you can do that. In fact, this is pretty much the architecture of a single page app, right? Where you have everything happening in JavaScript. You assume there's a network connection, and then you just take over and do everything in JavaScript. So I personally don't like working this way. And, and the reason is it kind of turns JavaScript into a single point of failure. Like it, just rendering text on a screen now is JavaScript's job. And if the JavaScript fails or something happens, you get nothing, right? So it turns it into this, this, this binary proposition where what you're building either doesn't work at all or it works great, assuming that JavaScript is, is supported, right? Now, I'll point out that in another medium, this makes total sense. If you're building an iOS app and I have an iOS device, it's going to work great. But if you're building an iOS app and I have an Android device, it just doesn't work at all. You can't install an iOS app on an Android device. So this binary mode of thinking absolutely works in other fields, but I don't think it's the right approach on the web. I think the power of the web is that we can build in a layered way. And so we can build from something that doesn't work, to something that just about works, right? Something that works fine, something that works well, to something that works great. We can, we can layer on at each stage. At the, we can do it with those technologies. We can do it within those technologies, specific API, specific CSS features, specific HTML, right? But this does map very nicely to the, the technologies of the web, right? Do you start with the URLs and then figure out what your HTML is going to be, figure out your JavaScript, and then add the behavior on top? Uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's remarkable how well this layered approach maps to the technologies we have. And I'm not alone in, in liking this layered approach. I'm going to quote my friend Ethan Marcotte, who said, I like designing in layers. 
I love looking at the design of a page, a pattern, whatever, and thinking about how it might change if, say, fonts aren't available or JavaScript doesn't work or if someone doesn't see the design as you and I might and is having the page read aloud to them. I think the, the tendency is when we come across a technology, maybe it's a new technology, we ask ourselves, well, how well does it work? That's a very reasonable question to ask, but I think there's a more important question, which is how well does it fail? If you use a technology that doesn't fail well, if it's a binary proposition, it either works great or doesn't work at all, then when it does fail, everything collapses. But if you use something that fails well, then people still get something. And that's why I like this layered approach. It fails well. Suppose something does happen to the JavaScript, either because of browser support or network conditions or browser extensions or your ISP doing something. Well, there's still the CSS and the HTML. And you know the core functionality should still work. Maybe something happens with the CSS, then the HTML is still available, right? Now, this idea of trying to go further down the stack, if it's at all possible, is a principle that influenced Tim Berners-Lee. It's something called the principle of least power, which says you should choose the least powerful language suitable for a given purpose, which sounds very counterintuitive. Why would I choose the least powerful language? But the idea is that the least powerful one is also the more stable place, the slower moving, more stable layer, less subject to change. Uh, this maps well to the web. I think the principle for least power absolutely, the principle of least power absolutely works on the web. Um, Derek Featherstone, he said this, quote, in the web front end stack, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and ARIA, if you can solve a problem with a simpler solution lower in the stack, you should. It's less fragile, more foolproof, and it just works. Right? So those, those are basically engineering reasons why you should use the principle of least power, right? More foolproof, less fragile. ARIA is a great example of this. The, the first rule of ARIA is if you don't need to use ARIA, don't use ARIA. If there's an existing HTML element that does the job, use that instead. Go down the stack, right? Now, I do get pushback on this when people say, well, this is fine if you're building something complex, but uh, I'm, or if you're building something simple, but I'm building something really complex. So this layered approach, it, it isn't going to work for me, right? Um, I don't think what you're building is maybe as complex as you think. I don't think this, this binary representation is how the world works. I think things are much, much more of a, of a gradient like this where things go from being simple to complex. And frankly, the thing, there aren't that many things that are tippity top of this gradient, but nobody likes to think they're working on something simple. Like if you're at a cocktail party and someone asks you what you do and you describe your work and someone says, oh yeah, that sounds easy. You'd be pretty offended, right? But if you're at a party and someone asks what you do and you say, oh, I, I do this work and they say, wow, that sounds really hard. You'd be like, yeah, yeah, what I do is really hard. So I think this is why people tend to reach for, you know, frameworks and libraries that are marketed as, as you know, these are for complex things. Uh, everyone likes to think they're working on complex problems. Um, on the web, the way we talk about it often is in terms of, you know, websites and web apps, like as though it's possible to divide the entire World Wide Web into two categories. There's websites and there's web apps. Again, it's it's not that simple. It is a gradient. Every web app is a website that's, you know, been given some sort of superpowers. I'm really not that keen even on the term web app, though I'm okay with progressive web app, which we've heard about already quite a bit today. Um, Cause I, you know, I, th I think progressive web apps are pretty darn great, but there is a lot of confusion around progressive web apps. If you, if you search for progressive web apps, you'll find a lot of hand wavy articles trying to define it saying like, Oh, it's a state of mind, man. Or it's, it's, it's an approach. It's, it's a, the experience. And that's bollocks. A progressive web app is, has three testable criteria. It is, a website that is running on HTTPS that has a web app manifest and a service worker. That's it. If you have those three things, you have a progressive web app. It is simultaneously a website and progressive web app. And now, uh, 
I'm not going to go into the details of these things. I will say that the service worker is probably the trickiest part. Um, if you want more details on how to code up a service worker, I've written a book uh, you can get from a book apart. Uh, but I will say when I first came across the idea of service workers, which is that it's a proxy that kind of sits between the browser and the network and intercepts network requests and can serve things from the cache, it kind of blew my mind because I had to reevaluate my mental model of the web. And so this is my mental model of how the web works, these layers of technologies. And with service workers, it's now possible to build something like this, where you can take away the lowest layers, the, the fundamental infrastructure of the web, which is the internet, the network itself, and still have a website work. That kind of blew my mind that this is even possible. So I started implementing this, started taking websites and turning them into progressive web apps. So i uh, got this website, huffduffer.com, which is kind of where you can make your own uh, podcast feeds using found sounds. And I added, you know, I made sure it was running on HTTPS, added a web app manifest, added a service worker. Now all the service worker does is it serves up an offline page if you're offline, right? It's really not much better than seeing a dinosaur, but at least it's branded like the website. So this is kind of not that much different to serving up a custom 404 page, a little bit of a marketing opportunity. But even that can be quite powerful. So like back in the days when we could attend real life events, uh, clear left, we ran this event called Ampersand about web typography. And I turned it into a progressive web app that served up an offline page that said, okay, you're offline, but here's the, all the details you need to know about the event like the, the date, the time, the place. So even if you're offline, you could get that information. Still very basic stuff, right? At the other end of the scale, um, or actually here's another nice uh, custom uh, offline page, Travago. Their whole thing is kind of based on search. So if you don't have a network connection, you can't do the search, but they still give you something to do. They give you this nice offline maze that you can play until you're, you're back online. Um, but here's a completely different approach. I put a web book uh, online. It's called Resilient Web Design. You can go to resilientwebdesign.com. It's free. And I mean free, as in you don't have to give me your email address and I'm not tracking you. It's literally free. Now, this is what it looks like when you're online. And this is what it looks like when you're offline. It's exactly the same. In fact, the moment you visit resilientwebdesign.com, it downloads the whole book and attempts from that point on to never use the network again. It is very much offline first. Okay, now that's a bit extreme because most websites have a mix of things you want to be cached and things you want to be fresh, right? So what I do on my own blog, adaptio.com, is uh, you, can, you can be reading something when you're online, but if you try to access it when you're offline, what you see is a custom offline page. Sorry, you're offline, but here are the articles you visited already. So you can revisit uh, things that you've read. It's you know a slight improvement. It gives you something more to do, but the problem with this is that I can only read things that I've already read. What's even better is if you can put the, the power in the hands of the, the user. That's what I did on this website, uh, archive.deconstruct.org. Deconstruct was another event that we used to run back when we could have physical events. Uh, but every talk from 10 years of the Deconstruct conference is online at this URL, archive.deconstruct.org. There's MP3s of every talk. And if you go to the talk page, you'll see the option to download the MP3 or this option to save for offline. When you can hit that toggle and it will save it on your device for offline use. So then when you are offline and you go to archive.deconstruct.org, you can't get anything fresh, but it will say, oh, here's what you saved for offline, what you chose to save offline. So now effectively, I've got a podcast player in the web browser. So... I guess my point here is that there's many, many layers of what you can do just with a service worker. And you can take this layered approach that, okay, if service workers are supported, maybe I'll just do some caching to improve performance. That's the most basic thing, bit of a no-brainer. Why not do that? Maybe I have a custom offline page. Again, no harm. Go for it. Ah, do I add the web app manifest, have the whole add to home screen thing? Um, yeah, you know, all these additions you can do to any website. What about push notifications? They are managed through service workers. It used to be if you wanted to make people's life a misery with push notifications, you had to build a native app. Now you can do it on the web. Or background sync where your website can sync up with the server even when the, uh, the user isn't on the website, right? These much more cutting edge APIs. But here's the thing. 
you can't count on any of these things being supported. And that's okay. All of these are layers that you can add on, right? I use service workers, uh, even though it's a JavaScript-based technology. And I said, oh, you don't want to be relying on JavaScript, but I'm not relying on it. I can only use service workers as an enhancement. Because even if a web browser does support service workers, first time they visit my website, there is no service worker, right? It has to be for subsequent visits. So I, I love the fact that it's been designed in a layered way. All of these technologies, you can use them to enhance what you've got. You can't make them as something that the, the, use, the user has to rely on. And I think that's a great way to approach you know, all technologies. So what you end up with is you've got these websites that now have been kind of elevated to behave very much like native apps, right? If someone does add them to the home screen, they can open even without the browser Chrome, they behave just like native apps. That's pretty cool. But you know what I think is even cooler is that these same progressive web apps could be opened in the first web browser ever built. There's no service worker, obviously. There isn't even any images or CSS, but the core functionality is still there. I can still use a link. I can still read. I think that's really quite something. You know, here's the very first website as it appears in the very first web browser. And that's pretty awesome. But what's just as awesome is that that very first website can also be opened in modern browsers. A browser that was just updated yesterday will still be able to display that very first website. That's quite something. And that's, that's something that's really special to the web. If you try to open up a word processing document from 30 years ago in a word processing app today, good luck with that. But the web has this unbroken line. Why? Because it's been built in this layered way. So I think we should build with the spirit of the web and also build in a layered way. And I hope that you will build with the layers of the web. Thank you very much for your attention.